Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to our latest webinar on Palisade. Um, I'm Kurt Roloff. Um, with me today are Yuri Polyakov and David Bruce Cousins. Uh, Yuri and David are both co-founders of the Palisade Library. They've been working with me on it uh, for many years. Um, we are taking after the previous episode where we focused on an introduction to the Palisade community and the Palisade project. We decided that we would have a three episode, three, three uh, episode mini series focused on applications of homomorphic encryption. The first one today, which is episode one, is going to focus on a uh, developer oriented introduction to homomorphic encryption with a focus on some recent advances that we're making to support Boolean arithmetic with applications. Uh, future episodes, which will be on the last Friday of every month, um, over the next several months, we'll be focusing on integer arithmetic, applications of homomorphic encryption over integers, and then in two months, an approximate number of arithmetic with applications over approximate uh, number applications. So uh, Yuri um, has a long story background. Uh, I'll let him introduce himself. Um, he's been involved with the um, uh, precursor programs that uh, motivated our application work on homework crypto. And uh, David and I have been working also together for many years, um, both on the original Proceed program, which Yuri was on also, uh, for hardware, software, embedded systems. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, Yuri, I believe, is talking first. And so without further ado, um, Yuri, please take it away. Thank you, Kurt. <clears throat> so, uh, Maybe first I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm a principal scientist with Duality Technologies, uh, just like uh, Kurt mentioned. I've been working on Palisade since the very beginning, since uh, November of 2014. Uh, and uh, uh, we've added a lot of functionality over the years and uh, we're going to discuss some of the functionality in the next uh, three episodes. Um, so uh, today's First uh, lecture will focus on the introduction to homomorphic encryption. And uh, specifically, uh, the agenda covers uh, the definition of homomorphic encryption. Uh, I would say without using any technical terms, what does it mean? How is it related to, to uh, other uh, encryption protocols? We will talk about the typical uh, computations that uh, homomorphic encryption supports and some examples of real scale applications. Uh, we'll also introduce some uh, concept, key concepts. And uh, then uh, we're going to talk about main approaches and the classes of homomorphic computations, the three groups um, of computations that uh, Kurt already mentioned. So the Boolean circuit approach, uh, the modular uh, exact arithmetic approach and approximate number approach. Uh, so more detailed uh, presentation, the Boolean circuit approach will follow. So Dave uh, will uh, present, uh, uh, we'll, we'll present some interesting material today about some applications related to Boolean circuits. And we will discuss the modular uh, arithmetic and approximate number approach in the following episodes. And we're also talk, we'll also talk about uh, setting the security parameters. So uh, we're starting with the basics part. So what is homomorphic encryption? Uh, probably the easiest way to define it you can think of it as an encryption protocol with standard uh, encryption, decryption, key generation uh, 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 procedures, plus one extra operation, evaluation. That, uh, you get the ability to compute on ciphertext. And uh, so the first uh, Im uh, important application, I mean, the uh, capability that homomorphic encryption um, enables users is to allow for computations on encrypted data. And the second uh, very important uh, benefit from homomorphic encryption is to enable outsourcing of data storage and processing. And how is homomorphic encryption related to the like, like classic uh, symmetric and public key encryption uh, that, that we've been working for many years on? And uh, in fact, it, you can think of it as a certain extension of both of them. So. Uh, uh, you, you can start with a symmetric key encryption scheme, or you can start with a public key encryption scheme, and then add this evaluation capability. So uh, it's uh, so either of those scenarios is supported. So it's just a, a certain um, protocol that gives you additional features. Something that's also very important to note: all uh, uh, schemes that we're going to discuss and we're going to present are based on lattices, and uh, which are believed to be uh, 
post quantum secure, so they're secure against quantum um, computer attacks. Uh, so this is additional benefit that we get from fully homomorphic encryption because it uses lattice cryptography. Uh, and as I mentioned, that one way to view the homomorphic encryption is the generalization of, of for instance, public encryption in this case. So some of the key milestones. Uh, so probably the first uh, fundamental milestone uh, is when the concept of uh, uh, fully homomorphic encryption of, uh, was uh, first discussed it would, in, in the paper by Vest, Edelman, and Virtuosis. Uh, the concept uh, uh, was discussed at the level, it would be nice to get this capability of uh, uh, basically being able to compute on arbitrary circuits. Uh, and it was posed as a challenging computer science problems. And uh, the uh, uh, problem that was not believed to be uh, basically attackable for many years and until uh, uh, the groundbreaking work of uh, Craig Gentry at the end of 2008, uh, when uh, he pre pre uh, presented the first design of a truly fully homomorphic encryption scheme, it was quite basic, it uh, operated on bits, uh, but uh, theoretically it provided a foundation uh, to enable uh, arbitrary computations over encrypted data. And then of over the years, several uh, schemes have been developed and five of them are considered as the core schemes now and uh, they're all implemented in Palisade and we'll be discussing uh, various aspects of those. They're very different from the original uh, Gentry's design. They're much more efficient, uh, but uh, the, uh, I would say that the Gentry's work uh, uh, laid the foundation uh, for this future uh, significantly improved works. So just an example of uh, um, homomorphic encryption workflow. So let's say we have uh, three parties in this case, certain client, we have a data source, and we have a computation host. And uh, in this case, we consider uh, the uh, uh, scenario of, uh, public, of uh, homomorphic encryption over public key encryption. So a certain FHE client sends a public key then uh, the data source uses uh, this public key to encrypt the data. Then the encrypted data is sent to the computation host. And uh, then the computation host sends the encrypted results uh, to the basically party that can basically review uh, the actual results. And uh, at that point, uh, the result of the computation can be decrypted. And the critical component here is that uh, the computation host performs all these computations in a non-interactive manner without getting access to the actual data. So how does uh, homomorphic encryption compare with other uh, approaches in the same domain? And uh, uh, in, in, in particular, in, I mean, in this slide, we consider homomorphic encryption versus secure multi-party and uh, uh, versus secure guard extensions, uh, the hardware-based solution. And there are a couple of different metrics we can use. So one of them is the performance metric. And uh, what's um, important is to explain the difference between homomorphic encryption versus MPC. Homomorphic encryption is always compute bound. It's the, the computations is the part that takes the most time. And uh, in the case of secure multi-party, it's the communication cost that's the highest. So it's network bound. In terms of the privacy model, uh, so uh, both HE and MPC work with basically encryption and, and I mean the way it's defined in the classic cryptography and there is an extra requirement in MPC of non-collusion because of the nature how uh, computations are performed they require interactions so there is this uh, 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 special requirement of non-collusion uh, in the case of uh, secure guard extensions it's the trusted ha uh, hardware that basically uh, is the foundation of the privacy and one major difference between homomorphic encryption and MPC is uh, uh, the mode of uh, interaction. So in the case of homomorphic encryption, uh, no interactions are needed and the full computation can be performed uh, without, I mean, by a single party uh, over the encrypted data. In the case of uh, MPC, interactions are required for the protocol basically uh, to be correct and to work. Um, and um, in terms of uh, cryptographic security, both uh, homomorphic encryption and MPC are typically based uh, on uh, either standard assumptions or some assumptions that are believed to be close to standard. Uh, in the case of secure guard extensions, uh, uh, there are some issues. We know quite a few attacks uh, that uh, uh, were discovered uh, in, in the past three, four years. 
Um, um, and um, so this is where uh, secure guard extensions are very different. So something to also note, in there are quite a few applications where it makes sense to combine these techniques. For example, homomorphic encryption can be com combined with MPC in some scenarios. So just to understand the typical operations that you can do with homomorphic encryption. So first, I would like to note that we work with numbers. So no matter whether we're working on text or uh, um, contextual data, we always have to convert it to numbers and then perform some operations um, on them. And so the first uh, and simplest uh, type of operations that we support are basically, I mean, it's essentially Boolean arithmetic. Uh, uh, such operations as, uh, as uh, and, or, XOR, and uh, Dave will uh, give a more detailed uh, uh, explanation of how those work uh, in the uh, HE domain. Then another type of uh, computations that homomorphic in encryption enables us to do is to in encrypt a relatively small integers and perform addition and multiplication. And the important part is there is a certain overflow condition. So this is exact integer arithmetic, and there is a condition of overflow. If an overflow occurs, the decryption result is no longer correct. So, um, but there is the limitation of this approach is usually, usually how large those integers can get. Then another uh, type of computation that homomorphic encryption supports uh, is the computation, with, uh, I mean, with, that, that deals with, let's say, Galois fields, so finite arithmetic. Uh, uh, let's, as an example, modular 256 computations. Uh, and the idea is that uh, uh, we can add up to numbers and apply mod uh, operation, modular reduction operation with respect to certain modules. And uh, this is actually the native mode for some of the schemes uh, that are supported. Then a very popular type of computation uh, is, deals with uh, 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 essentially fixed point, fixed point uh, uh, number arithmetic with some elements of floating uh, point computations. And we'll discuss this in detail during episode three. Uh, but this is like, these are the computations that you would do in practice when dealing with matrix arithmetic uh, or let's say polynomial evaluation. Uh, so very interesting and powerful concept uh, uh, that to be honest is used in many uh, applications. In, in, I mean, uh, that's been used and very, lo looked very promising in the past few years. And uh, there are different, uh, I mean, the, there are different nuances of, uh, for instance, certain encryption schemes support uh, some plain text types. Uh, uh, they support certain uh, types of operations. So there, there are some differences in uh, the uh, schemes based on the computations that they support. And that's why we introduce three classes for those. Uh, so some examples of uh, real scale applications. So these are just examples of where homomorphic encryption has been used uh, to uh, uh, solve problems at the real scale, the scale that we see, I mean, uh, in, in essentially in real life. So one of them is uh, uh, private information retrieval. The idea is uh, you, or qu you query a database, you get a certain record without disclosing what uh, basically record or what uh, information uh, uh, you access, I mean, without disclosing it to the basically data source provider. And there are some really nice results that were uh, published in uh, IEEE and s &P in 2018. Then private set intersection is another very interesting example uh, where we need to find uh, basically an intersection of uh, two data sets uh, in a privacy preserving manner. And some very nice results with a large scale has been reported, have been reported in, for instance, in CCS 2017. Another uh, real scale uh, use case is genome wide association studies uh, based on various techniques uh, related to learning to training, uh, such as logistic regression training and, and, and uh, statistical techniques such as chi-squared test. Uh, and this was recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and then another uh, example that uh, is, has been explored and that has seen many advances over uh, the past uh, years is logistic regression training. Some interesting results are presented uh, uh, in the basically in, uh, in the conference uh, proceedings of, uh, uh, on artificial intelligence. And uh, so now uh, we're uh, moving to main concepts and uh, Kurt, are there any outstanding questions that uh, uh, I should answer before I proceed to the... Okay. 
So probably no questions. Okay, so the main concepts uh, that uh, uh, are important to understand homomorphic encryption. Uh, the word homomorphic first, what does it mean? So it's a certain mapping from plain text space, so the data basically which corresponds to the data that we're encrypting, so the data in the clear, to cipher text space that preserves arithmetic operations. So the same operations that you can uh, perform on the plain text can be performed on the cipher text. Uh, so another important concept um, is related to the hardness of why is this, why are these uh, schemes are secure, a and all five schemes that we're focusing on uh, in this three episodes and that Palisade focuses on in the context of FHE are based on either learning with errors or ring learning with errors assumption. So it's a post-quantum assumption, and it's it's basically a, 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 a certain mathematical problem that is related to linear systems of equation with some noise that gets introduced and, and it's uh, known to be secure. And a lot of the parameters that we choose um, uh, uh, for a secure implementation of FHE uh, are based on this, uh, uh, on this problem and it's a uh, uh, secure setting. So then the, about the security level, how do we typically talk about it? So the latest security level with uh, uh, is quite complicated and there are a number of parameters, but there is an equivalent simpler representation in terms of a work factor. Uh, and uh, so in other words, uh, it's the same concepts that use uh, for AS, it's used for um, other encryption protocols and uh, the, for, the work factor of let's say 128 bits means that it takes two to the power of 128 certain primitive operations to break using best known lattice attack. So, uh, there is a uh, number of attacks and we, the best one is chosen uh, to basically characterize this. And there is a, uh, a special homomorphic encryption standard uh, that describes the parameters that can be used. And we'll, we'll go over that uh, closer to the end of this talk. So then uh, the uh, plain text uh, representation itself. Uh, so one way to look at it is it's a in for most of the schemes it's a certain polynomial and the polynomial has uh, uh, integer coefficients but finite uh, coefficients so they're they're uh, uh, the arithmetic is done modular p in this case uh, plain text modulus and uh, this uh, in, in addition to that uh, this uh, Polynomials are divided by another polynomial, basically x taken to the n plus one. So n in this case is often uh, called uh, uh, either ciphertext dimension or ring dimension. So this is a certain type of polynomials that uh, allow us to basically that we represent the data as those polynomials and then we can perform operations. And then the ciphertext typically works with the same type of polynomials but with a much larger modulus. So in this case, modular Q, uh, so this, it's called ciphertext modulus, is typically much higher than plain text modulus P, and it's related uh, to the concept of noise. Uh, and uh, the use of ring learning with errors requires introducing, injecting a certain random integers with Gaussian distribution and this, uh, on the one hand, is needed for security. On the other hand, it uh, um, basically introduces certain noise that uh, uh, may limit the what can be computed. And uh, the essentially the difference or the ratio between this ciphertext modulus Q and plain text modulus P in terms of the errors that are, uh, or noise that accumulates, that's what uh, uh, that, that's the main part of. Uh, uh, both the correctness and performance analysis and optimizations in the case of FHE. And we'll talk about the noise part a little bit more just to explain the intuition. Uh, so uh, in terms of this uh, uh, ciphertext modulus Q and plain text modulus Q, we're, we're gonna look at a simple uh, process of encryption and how and what basically it represents. So we have a certain plain text modulus P, so the actual data that we're uh, setting uh, to be uh, not higher than uh, uh, modulus P, which is the plain text modulus. Then we're going to apply a special mask that's a random mask that's needed for the, uh, basically for the encryption itself with certain noise. So with this noise is injected for security 
um, uh, uh, of uh, learning, uh, ring learning with errors or learning with errors. And we get a ciphertext basically from this. So the sum of all these three elements uh, is the ciphertext. So the important part is to watch the noise uh, and we're going to observe what happens as computations progress. So as we uh, perform more computations, let's say additions, multiplications, this noise will increase. Because, uh, uh, and uh, um, the, now it's important to watch uh, up to what level it can increase because uh, as soon as it uh, reaches a certain threshold, the decryption will no longer be correct. And our goal when we uh, select the parameters to uh, prevent the situation because uh, uh, it would be, I mean, obviously correctness issue is not something that uh, we want to happen. And so just to illustrate this, uh, when we've got, we've performed too many computations and our parameters did not support for this, we got too much noise. We got essentially the, uh, you can think of it as an overflow condition in a sense. Um, and uh, the, uh, now the, when we decrypt, the result doesn't make any sense. So we essentially lost the uh, initial data. And uh, the groundbreaking part about uh, Gentry's work, and that's also uh, supported by the later schemes, was to introduce the procedure of bootstrapping. And the procedure of bootstrapping, it's, you can also think of it as a noise refreshing procedure, allows you to take a uh, ciphertext with a certain noise level. So this ciphertext has, still has to be decryptable at this point, and then basically shrink, reduce that noise to a certain preset level, to, to the basic level of refreshed noise. And typically that level of refreshed noise is uh, the noise that's needed to evaluate the decryption circuit homomorphically. So this is, we, we can always reset it to that noise as a, uh, using the bootstrapping procedure. So this bootstrapping procedure was uh, the key element uh, behind uh, uh, the, uh, the concept of fully homomorphic encryption. And now we can try to classify different uh, 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 types of homomorphic encryption based on the operations uh, that uh, they support. So now that we've introduced some concepts. So the simplest and weakest notion in a sense in terms of capabilities uh, is partially homomorphic encryption. Uh, and this uh, supports only one type of operation, addition or multiplication. For instance, Payet scheme is the classical example of this notion of partially homomorphic encryption. Then the next level uh, of uh, homomorphic encryption is somewhat homomorphic encryption. And it uh, typically supports uh, two gates, so such as addition and multiplication, for instance, uh, um, and, uh, but only for a subset of circuits. So the capabilities are quite limited because of uh, essentially very, fast growth of noise in, uh, in, this in the case of the somewhat homomorphic encryption schemes. Then there is um, another type, which the one that one of the two types that we're going to focus in this uh, three episodes is leveled fully homomorphic encryption. Sometimes it's simply called leveled homomorphic encryption. And the idea is that uh, uh, you can support relatively uh, deep computations, deep means the multiplicative depth of computations is relatively large, let's say like in the tens, uh, um, and which is much uh, larger than what some somewhat homomorphic encryption schemes can support. But the important constraint that uh, we have in this case is that we need to uh, know the maximum depth that can be supported uh, uh, for uh, well, basically uh, before the computation. So that limit has to be set in advance, uh, but uh, uh, the limit can be relatively high so that a lot of practical computations can be performed. And then the strongest notion of uh, homomorphic encryption is fully homomorphic encryption. And essentially that's the one that includes bootstrapping. That's the one uh, that includes the procedure of bootstrapping. You can always refresh the noise to a certain level preset level and uh, there is no limit to what computations you can perform other than let's say the runtime that it takes uh, to perform the computations. Um, and uh, uh, so these are the two types leveled fully homomorphic encryption and fully homomorphic encryptions that are implemented in Palisade and that we're going to talk about. So today we're going to focus on uh, two schemes uh, uh, 
that implement fully homomorphic encryption. So uh, now we're going to move to the next section, uh, the main approaches of homomorphic computations. Uh, so just want to check, uh, are there any questions? Because this is a good uh, point to answer any questions. So Kurt or Dave, any questions that, um, so let's. So I, I've been answering some of the questions as we go and I was just typing up a few different answers. Um, one question from Hassan was about why only numbers? And uh, basically I just said that uh, generally integers are supported natively in most of the FHE schemes. And then we put a lot of research, you know, us and the general community puts a lot of effort into encoding, you know, more general data types um, into FHE similar to how um, in computer science, for example, there's generally a lot of effort that encodes things as bits, um, such as in x86 architectures and things like that. Um, Phil, and either of you want to add anything to that? Yeah, maybe I'll just add a quick comment. So it's, uh, it's not just FHE that works with numbers. Any uh, classical, uh, let, let's say, public encryption algorithm that we know uh, 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 of, like RSA, for example, has to compute, it has to convert the inputs into numbers. So it's, it's very common, any number theory based approach. So it's a, it's a very common technique and not just, uh, uh, that's not just specific to FHE. Right, and then there's another question from an anonymous attendee, um, is what do you do with text to make it numbers uh, turn into a prime? And basically I said, you know, similar to the, the, the first question that, that was asked by Hassan, is that this is an active area of the research and there's no one standard encoding in general use. Uh, early work that we did back in 2011, 2012, looked at encoding ASCII characters decomposed as bits and then encoded as mod two integers. There's been, you know, any numerous approaches um, you know, most are, are heuristic, some, some are very good for some applications, but there's no one standard, but there are, you know, multiple techniques that people have been looking at. Anything agree. you guys want to add? Yeah. Oh, I completely agree. I, I could yeah. add something, and that is, um, in, in general, if, if you think about it, right, you know, all of, <clears throat> if you're thinking about in, in, encrypting text, text is really just a, a sequence of numbers, right? So you've encoded numbers into ASCII or to, uh, you know, um, uh, other other kinds of, uh, you know, more extended character sets. So really, you know, what you're doing is extending the concept of, of encoding into this encrypted domain. So depending on what you wanted to do with the text, you would encrypt it in different ways. Right, and then there's another question, uh, which I'll, I'll just answer offline. I'll, I'll copy paste a bunch of material. Uh, Prajwal was asking, is, is basically saying that he's new to the field of Lattice, Lattice Crypto and welcome. You know, happy to have you. Um, and uh, he's asking, could we suggest some resources uh, where he can learn about LWE, ring LWE concepts? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go collect some material and post it into the uh, answer for that as we go. There's a bunch of things that we like. It's, it's all, you know, Wild West in some sense also. Uh, uh, there's been some people who have done some very, very exciting work and some good surveys that are out there. Um, everyone has their own preference, and, and so whatever I share is not going to be authoritative, but uh, at least a good start. We'll go from there. Yeah, and probably um, the first. If you guys want to add, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the first source would be the homomorphic encryption security standard because it tries to summarize some of some of the facts related to lattices. So I would suggest. I mean, we'll we'll mention it later in this talk, but uh, that's something I would suggest. That. Right, and there's a bunch of other questions that are coming in. Uh, Alamine is asking, uh, what is the size of P and Q? Uh, short answer to that is that um, that's, of course, an active area of active research and cryptanalysis. There have been standards that have been set through the homomorphicencryption.org standards organization, and there's standard lookup tables over there that people use, particularly for size of Q, which depends on P and a few other things. Um, it, it can be quite quite um, uh, confusing sometimes, which we, we like to recommend using the standard tables to guarantee security. And I'll type up an answer to that with a link to the, uh, the yeah, standard. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll just add a comment that it's, it varies. So the size of P and Q. So for instance, uh, for the schemes that Dave is going to talk about, both are relatively small. Uh, so basically P is either two or four, I mean, depending on how you, you will view the operations. Uh, and Q could be as small uh, as uh, 512. So, but this is a very special case. So for other schemes that we're going to consider in, in the next two episodes, typically uh, Qs are uh, much larger. And P, P is, of course, a functional parameter. What, what type of computation you're supporting? It's, uh, so it's, so we'll, we'll, we'll cover some of those uh, 
so we'll talk about this uh, uh, in detail, especially in the next two episodes. So we'll try to answer this uh, question uh, comprehensively at that point. Right. Um, and then uh, I'm sorry if I'm going to mangle your name, um, uh, Sad Dev or Jed Dev, to pick us depending if you're Turkish or not. I don't know. Uh, does HE need a random oracle? Um, Yuri, do you want to take that one? I mean, it's it's like everything is based on uh, like a learning uh, with errors assumption. So I think it's it's kind of it's uh, better to uh, explain a little bit uh, the how learning with errors work. And, and you know, I, I'd rather give a like more detailed answer to this question rather than just uh, basically that, that that would be my suggestion. Is and, and so that's something we'll we'll, we'll cover in, in some of the future seminars just to explain actually uh, explain the security a little bit more to, to explain a little bit the model because, because just saying random oracle not random oracle doesn't I don't think it's it's, it's by, by itself it's going to be too useful. yeah like 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 anything homework for crypto or, or in in lattice crypto it's um, you know, there's quite a bit of nuance into um, how some of these concepts map and uh, good point. Um, and then there's another question from uh, anonymous, atten anonymous attendee. Uh, do we see standard standardization around the encoding of FHE? Uh, short answer is that there has been some attempts through the standards organization, homeworkfromencryption.org, to look at uh, standard, basically, you know, effectively standard encodings or attempts at standard encodings for things that look like a uh, uh, RFP. Um, although this has not really gotten a lot of traction yet. Um, and so we don't see a lot of hard standards yet around the um, encodings. Uh, there are some general best practices that people in the community follow, but uh, I wouldn't say that there's any kind of hard to fast standards, but there are, like I said, a bunch of kind of community understood tricks that people generally tend to use for efficient computation. Yuri or Dave, anything you want to add? Yeah, I would agree. So encoding is a very special question and we'll try to cover some basics of encoding in the next two episodes. So that, that's, they, it's a, going to be especially right. important for the uh, integer and approximate number uh, arithmetic schemes. Then there's a, a question about, uh, you know, reference to the standards. I'll send that. I'll put that in the answer. And then there's uh, another question about how do you perform F FHE operations on images? How do you encode it? And uh, basically that's a very active area of research. Uh, you know, I could, I'll try to post a couple links to papers like Gazelle, uh, the Gazelle framework from one of our longtime partners, Vinod, uh, who had looked at encoding of images and, and a few other uh, sources, but uh, it's a very active area of research. Okay, good. Thank you, Kurt. Oh, Yuri, Dave, anything else? Yeah. So we get a lot of good questions. This is great. Um, and uh, so we're going to get back to the um, uh, webinar and we'll, we'll pause for questions a little, again in a little while. Thank you, Kurt. Um, also, you have a um, uh, actually a, a rather famous person on, on the line who was very formative in Lattice Crypto, uh, Daniele Machancio. Uh, he typed into the panelists a quick answer also about the random oracles. And, and Daniele, if you don't mind me quoting you, um, I don't think he says, and I'm quoting him, I don't think random oracles are used anywhere in FHE. Uh, random oracles are, are not homomorphic, so they're just hard to use in conjunction with FHE. So, uh, you know, that's, that's from Daniele. Daniele, hopefully I'm not doing you a disservice just by reading you verbatim, but uh, happy to kind of uh, uh, follow up with some uh, written answers too. Okay. Yeah, thank and you. Daniele says, okay. Well, thank you, Daniele. Yeah, maybe just related to that question, uh, we, we would like, you know, in the future, we'll try to explain a little bit more because we have a webinar planned on uh, uh, lattice security and the models uh, uh, and uh, that will explain in more detail because this is just one very specific aspect which is why I, 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 I prefer not to answer it immediately. Um, uh, so this is just something we're planning to cover in, in uh, uh, one of the uh, seminars in the nearest future. Great, well, th thank you everyone. Thank you for the questions, keep them coming. Uh, we'll go back to the uh, webinar and we'll, we'll uh, come back to Q&A later. And I'll, okay. I'll start thank typing you. some of these up. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So now we're moving to the part of classes of homomorphic uh, computations. And, uh, it, and it's a, actually a very important question. Uh, there are multiple schemes available. There are multiple uh, computation models that are supported. What are those models? And, and uh, we classify schemes into the types of computations they support. So, um, 
the first type, Boolean circuits, represent plain text is represented as bits, and computations are expressed as Boolean circuits. Uh, I, uh, I would say uh, a lot of uh, information will be provided uh, in Dave's talk on this, so I probably will keep it to minimum in this um, in my talk. So the other uh, approach is uh, modular or exact arithmetic. The idea is we represent the plain text data as integers moduli plain text modulus p. I mean certain modulus, and what what does it support? So it's it's either supports integer on, uh, I mean, it supports arithmetic on integers that do not, there is where the result or any intermediate, uh, any, the final result or intermediate results do not exceed P. So in this case, it's exact integer arithmetic, or it can be used for the actual finite uh, piece of field arithmetic, where the goal is to uh, uh, for the numbers to wrap around such like, like let's say in the AAS computation or work. Uh, um, so that's, uh, those are the two flavors. So either it's exact integer arithmetic or finite field arithmetic. Then the third approach is the approximate number arithmetic, which works with uh, real numbers or, you know, also supports complex numbers. And this approach is somewhat similar to floating point arithmetic, but is different. It's not, it's not the, uh, uh, the way we see floating point arithmetic in, uh, I mean, in, in, let's say, in, in our computers. In this case, we st are still dealing with fixed point numbers, but we have a certain operation of rescaling that allows us to adjust the scale. So these are the three main flavors of homomorphic computations that are supported. And when choosing the scheme or choosing how you approach a specific problem, uh, uh, the choice of the approach should certainly be considered. So the Boolean circuits, uh, and I'll probably keep it to a minimum here. Uh, what are the main benefits? Fast number comparison. So comparison is a challenge for other schemes. It supports arbitrary Boolean circuits and what we're actually going to see later. Uh, and typically uh, uh, in the, uh, this Boolean circuits approach and the schemes that support this approach, bootstrapping is a very common technique that is used uh, quite often, like uh, in the case of uh, the two schemes that they will present, uh, the few uh, TFEG schemes, uh, bootstrapping can be done even after every gate, so for each computation. So this, from the schemes perspective, so there is a, uh, uh, there is, I would say, foundational scheme, uh, the gentry a high water scheme, uh, that uh, presented some very interesting concepts, different from what the ones that are used uh, in the other schemes. And then, uh, there are two uh, practical schemes. I mean, so JSW, I wouldn't call it practical to be honest, but there are two practical schemes that used JSW or more specifically ring JSW uh, to get a very efficient bootstrapping procedure. So, uh, so uh, this is, and we'll have a more detailed discussion of that. So modular exact arithmetic approach. Um, it's, so one very important, um, difference in this approach as compared to the Boolean circuits approach is that operations, CMT type operations are supported for vectors of integers. For instance, if you need to, to do a component wise product of two vectors of uh, size, let's say 4,096 integers each, it can be done in a single homomorphic multiplication. So in a CMD manner, basically, uh, in, in, in a parallel manner, in vectorized manner. So this is, uh, so this technique is called packing or batching is a very important technique that often gives uh, performance benefits uh, to this approach as compared, let's say to Boolean circuits approach uh, for certain types of computations. Then uh, another uh, feature that this type of arithmetic supports is uh, fast, high precision integer arithmetic. So if we encode a single integer into a ciphertext into a polynomial, we could uh, effectively support uh, uh, really high precision, I mean, uh, integer computations with high precision exact computations. Uh, so that option is available. It's not often used because very, in many real computations, we don't need high precision. We don't need integer arithmetic with, with uh, let's say, uh, with a precision of 1000 bits, but this option is also available. So then there is um, the, the, like the common applications that I already mentioned previously of this approach uh, that use the schemes from this approach are 
uh, private in, uh, information retrieval and private set intersection. So these are, uh, uh, I would say, real scale applications uh, that are based on this approach. And what's also important is that typically many computations, uh, many uh, computations involving this approach uh, use the so-called the uh, concept of leveled fully homomorphic encryption. So they do not do bootstrapping and bootstrapping is quite expensive in those cases. So it's uh, a lot of powerful relatively deep computations can be done without the bootstrapping procedure. So what are the schemes? Um, uh, the, I would say the found, one of the foundational scheme uh, for uh, uh, the actual schemes that we use now, which are BGV and BFP, was the BV scheme uh, proposed, uh, I mean, uh, Berkersky, Lake, and uh, in uh, 2011. There were, there were some others, of course. Uh, but uh, currently, uh, uh, we deal with efficient implementation of uh, Berkersky, Gentry, Lake, and Tanathan, BGV, and Berkersky, Fenver, Carter, and BFP schemes. So these are the two uh, core schemes for this type of computations. and. Uh, of course, we'll discuss uh, them in uh, the, the next episode in more detail. So then the uh, third approach is the approximate number arithmetic approach. Just like the integer approach, this uh, it supports CMD computation. So uh, it supports packing vectors of real numbers. And uh, 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 for instance, doing, multiplying a lot of numbers uh, uh, using a single uh, homomorphic multiplication. It uh, features fast polynomial approximation. So in other words, any complex nonlinear function that can be represented as a polynomial of even a relatively large degree can be computed uh, relatively fast. So basically in an approximated way using uh, this approach. So that's a very important capability uh, that only, I mean, like at, at a real scale and, and for relatively advanced functions that's only this approach supports. It also, as a, a byproduct of this, it for instance can support relatively fast multiplicative inverse in, in terms of polynomial approximation and has support for uh, operations such as discrete Fourier transform. Uh, this approach has been used for relatively deep approximate computations that can tolerate basically the approximation error. Uh, such as logistic regression learning. Very often, uh, though not as often as in the case of integer arithmetic, uh, this approach is use, uses the concept of leveled fully homomorphic encryption without bootstrapping, but, uh, there, but there are some applications such as logistic regression learning that do benefit from bootstrapping. Uh, so as far as the schemes, essentially there is only one scheme uh, that's available. It's uh, the Cheon Kim Kim Son scheme. Uh, and there are many modifications and improvements, RNS variants of the scheme, but uh, uh, the underlying scheme, um, I mean, often referred to as the CKKS scheme, is the main basis for this. And it's also supported in Talset. So uh, just maybe as, as a summary, uh, so there are three classes of uh, schemes. I mean, uh, of, there are three approaches. And the first approach that we covered was the, the Boolean approach. Uh, so it's supported by Palisade and few and TFHE schemes are the two schemes that are supported there. Then there is, for the integer approach, there is uh, BGV and BFP. It's, both of those schemes are supported. And then there is CKKS. So uh, within Palisade, you can choose uh, which of the three approaches uh, you want to use. And one final topic uh, of this introductory lecture is about the security parameters. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give a, uh, a little bit of background. So uh, in general, choosing the security parameters uh, uh, for uh, lattice cryptography, lattice-based cryptography is a very difficult task. But very significant attempts have been made to simplify it and essentially convert it to the uh, format where we have a work factor. There is a special, uh, uh, there is a special basically program that was developed, software that was developed, LW estimator, um, that was developed by Martin Albrecht's group uh, that allows to estimate a work factor for given parameters. And this uh, uh, LW estimator was used as the basis uh, for the uh, homomorphic encryption security standard. And uh, so there is a major standardization effort uh, 
which includes uh, uh, many uh, well-known organizations and uh, uh, universities um, and it's there is so the website is homomorphicencryption.org it's essentially at the moment main community standardizing uh, I'll put body in quotes but it's 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 the consortium that tries to standardize uh, fully homomorphic encryption and one of the critical documents that this consortium has uh, uh, developed has uh, proposed is the security standard and currently I'm just going to refer to one of the tables of that document uh, so the the standard document can be just downloaded from the site it's very easy to find so so the critical uh, so I'm, i'll explain a little bit the numbers so the security level is the work factor so this two to the power of 128 that i previously talked about and then uh the other two parameters that are uh, relevant to security are uh basically this parameter n which is sometimes called ring dimension sometimes uh, called lattice parameter uh, sometimes uh, simply called uh, ciphertext dimension uh so and uh, and this is this parameter is related to the underlying security uh, uh of lwe or ring lwe and corresponds to the size of polynomials we deal with and then there is a this log q so the number of bits in the ciphertext Modulus, that's a functional parameter. That's how much can you compute? And the, and the typical idea is uh, uh, you try to, for, for the given level of security, so in this case, 128 bits of security, uh, if we're able to perform all computations with, let's say, log Q up to 109, then we can choose the minimum supported uh, uh, ciphertext dimension or ring dimension 4096. So the idea is we're trying to up minimize both of those parameters and still find the configuration that gives us uh, a certain level of security. Uh, so for instance, if uh, uh, our estimates of uh, correctness suggest that uh, 100 bits of security needed for log queue, we can choose this setting. If uh, they show 115, we, we would have to go uh, to the next uh, uh, to the next ring dimension, to the next ciphertext dimension, uh, 8192, which essentially doubles the uh, runtime. So this is this is the trade-off, and we'll talk about this in future seminars in more detail. We'll provide the foundations of this, but this table in this document is something that uh, we could suggest uh, uh, as the first starting point. And this is uh, uh, the last slide of my presentations. Uh, so any further questions? Yeah, so I, I, I've been typing them through as we go. Um, and then there's a question from uh, Narendra. Hopefully I'm not mangling your name. Um, does Palisade support bootstrapping for approximate arithmetic operations? Yuri, this is all you. Uh, so it's, 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 it's a good question. So the current open source version of uh, uh, Palisade does not support CKKS bootstrapping. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, and uh, when uh, it will be included in the policy, that's a question that's being discussed. So more from the usability perspective. So the, the biggest questions are related to usability. So it's it's certainly a question we're actively discussing. But at the moment, the current version of policy does not support. So Yuri, I think there's also a case, and please correct me, that we do have a version that is working in uh, prototype that we're actively using. Uh, like I said, I think it's a usability issue. Um, usability just because there's so many, you know, you know, manipulations of parameters that have to go on. Is, is there a version in, in the development branch of uh, Palisade right now? I, I can't recall off the top of my head. It's not currently, no, it's not currently in the developers. Yes, we do certainly have, have a prototype, uh, an efficient prototype. Of okay. this, but uh, it's, it's, we've been, it's the usability question basically that we've been trying to uh, resolve. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think it's, uh, if, I, if I frame it this way, we have what we call euphemistically a friends and family version of Palisade for people that help us with uh, usability bug fixes and things like that. And I believe it's in one of the friends and family releases that we've exposed to some people, but not, not to the broader community. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then uh, there's a question from Sanaz about, uh, does it support the CKK, I assume you mean CKS scheme? Yeah. So short answer, short answer is yep. I'm happy yeah, to do yeah, so. I, yeah, that's probably it's probably the question was asked before that part of the presentation. So yeah, we actually discussed. Yeah. It. Mm -hmm. 
And then uh, anonymous attendee asks uh, for security security parameters. Are we to understand that Palisade only goes up to security level for 256 bit encryption? Uh, the short answer is that the standard only goes up to 256 bit encryption. You know, Palisade you could tweak it to go up as as, as secure as you want to. Yuri? Yeah. So it's it's to be honest. Yeah. So so the standard goes up to 256, and the libraries that you know implement the standards such as Palisade and Seal. I mean, certainly support that. Uh, I'm not sure more than just just on the practical side uh that supporting more than 256 bits is required anywhere i mean that that uh, because it's really we're talking about the work factor of two to the power of 256 and uh it's i mean if we compare this to the time of the universe we'll, we'll probably get some interesting results there so I, I would say it's not i mean it's the community typically thinks it's 256 is the highest you would ever want to go right and there are actually a fair bit of questions coming in uh, William is asking is if, if I need a very large multiple to depth, what is the point where bootstrapping becomes more efficient than standard L, um, uh, LHE well, with very large parameters? Yeah. Very good question. And short, short answer is, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is a area of, of research. Um, generally, you know, rule of thumb, and this is going to be hard to come up with a really pithy short, short answer. Uh, it depends on application, of course. But generally, anywhere once you get up to around like depth ten to twenty, it starts to make sense. Now, Yuri, do you want to correct me on anything on that? Yeah. It depends on the computation. It 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 it's, it uh, depends on the computation yeah. and uh, how many uh, let's say computations at a given level are performed. Uh, for instance, uh, it's it's I would say it's the main optimization problem uh, uh, for uh, you know applications such as, for example, like uh, uh, logistic regression learning or something like that that's finding the optimum, finding the optimal uh, uh, configuration. So I would say uh, it's a very interesting, important question. It's one, it's the main optimization question typically. Right. Um, Anonymous attendee asks, how might one compare a 256 bit HE with standard crypto like AES 256 bit? Um, this gets into a deeper cryptanalysis question. Uh, um, yeah. You know, yeah, Yuri, can, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I can I can basically kind of give a high level I mean answer to this I mean uh, maybe if, I mean if Danielle uh, you know decides to provide a bit more uh, detailed answer but the kind of in the case of AS two fifty six the belief is that uh, the work factor that's needed to break basically AS two fifty six is close to two fifty six bits in reality it's a little bit lower as certain attacks shown. Uh, so, like uh, it, the actual work factor is slightly less than 256, but basically. In this case, we're talking about the work factor, not the key size of uh, uh, of basically of uh, homomorphic encryption. So, in that sense, it's uh, based on the current understanding. It's no worse than AS 256. Basically, that's the, that's the simple answer because the work factor we're talking about the work factor, and for AS 256, it's actually slightly lower than. Uh, 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 256. So that's 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 uh, very comparable, I would say, basically. But I don't know if 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 uh, Danielle, if you decide to provide any further comments, uh, then uh, yeah, I'm, we'll we'll be yeah, happy. Yeah, I think those I over. think it's kind of the typical is uh, generally comparable, but there's a lot of nuance that goes into it. Um, and then let's see. I think those are all the questions. Uh, Danielle asks. Um, uh, increasing. Uh, you might want to just copy it over, probably, Kurt, if you want to yeah. copy over the message to to the uh, to everyone. Okay, I'll do that. Um, so thank you, thank you again, Danielle. Uh, all right, so I guess it's now we transition over to Dave and and uh, getting into the uh, some of the application work. Is it uh, is it good to take a one or two minute break first uh, to give people a chance to reboot and uh, or we can go right in if you wish. Um, let, let's dive in. Uh, we can take a minute break if you want one, but I think we can just dive in. I mean, it's 11.58, Kurt, so maybe two minutes. Just to, to All right, two time. minutes. <laughs> I have to be the, uh, the clock, clock guardian or something. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll pause.